This is what I recommend to people who ask me how to get published. Trust your reader. Stop spoon-feeding your reader. Give your reader credit for being as smart as you, at least. Concentrate on sharpening your memory and peeling your sensibility. Cut every page you write by at least one-third. Stop constructing those piffling little similes of yours. Work out what it is you want to say. Then say it in the most direct and vigorous way you can. Eat meat. Drink blood. Give up your social life and don't think you can have friends. Rise in the quiet hours of the night and prick your fingertips and use the blood for ink. But do I take my own advice? Not a bit. Hilary Mantel is an intense, troubling and evocative writer. Her principal themes are of history and individual identity, religion and rebellion, and the influence of the dead upon the living. Her fiction asks how we come to be the people we are, and it occupies the hinterland between what is real and what is imagined. It's a world in which nothing is quite what it seems. Hilary, whenever I read your work, I have to say that I find it rather unsettling and disturbing. It makes me feel unstable. Is that a deliberate effect? Are you seeking that effect? I don't think I can help it. It's very much the way I view the world, I think. I don't trust it tremendously. I always feel that if I put my hand on the wall, my hand might go through it. I think as a child, you see, I was always listening hard. I was always trying to get some purchase on what was going on and work out what was happening in the next room. And there's a little bit in Wolf Hall where Cardinal Wolsey says, uh, never let me hear you say, you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Find out. And that, I spent my childhood trying to do that. So that becomes a habit. You really do need to know for your self-preservation whether the devil is behind that door. Not everyone thinks that. Fools. <laughs> the visitor's idea of hospital is different from the patient's idea. Visitors imagine themselves trapped in that ward, in that bed, in their present state of assertive well-being. They imagine being bored, but boredom occurs when your consciousness ranges about, looking for somewhere to settle. But the patient's concentration is distilled, moment by moment. Breathing, not being sick, not coughing, or else coughing in the right way, producing bodily secretions in the vessels provided and not on the floor. The visitor sees the hospital as needles and knives, metal teeth, metal bars, sees the foggy meeting between the damp summer air outside and the overheated exhalations of the sick room. But the patient sees no such contrast. She can't imagine the street, the motorway. To her, the hospital is this squashed pillow, this water glass, this bell pull, and the nice judgment required to know when to use it. For the visitor, everything points outwards to the release at the end of the visiting hour, and to the patient, everything points inwards, and the furthest extension of her consciousness is not the rattle of car keys, the road home, the first drink of the evening, but the beep and plip plop of monitors and drips, the flashing of figures on screens. These are how you register your existence. These are the way you matter. 
After the endometriosis recurred, when I was in my early 30s, uh, I was given a drug which doubled my size. So from being something like a pencil line on the wall, I became the blossoming sofa-like creature you see now before you. And that is very strange. And of course, it, um, for, for a woman, it's terribly destroying to one's self-image and self-projection. But what can you do? You're only given one body to live in. You've just got to get on with it. What I would have liked was a choice in life, leisure, to reverse my earlier decision that children didn't matter to me. Leisure to ask if circumstances or my mind had changed. No one can predict that the game will be over for them at the age of 27. The time I fell in love is the time I should have acted. And now that an era of my life is over, and my school friends are becoming grandmothers. I miss the child I never had. What's to be done with the lost, the dead, but write them into being? Al talked about passing. She talked about spirit. She talked about passing into spirit world, to that eventless realm, neither hot nor cold, neither hilly nor flat, where the dead, each at their own best age, are marooned in an eternal afternoon, past the ages, with sod all going on. Spirit world, as Al describes it to the trade, is a garden, or to be more accurate, a public place in the open air, litter-free like an old-fashioned park with a bandstand in a heat haze in the distance. Here the dead sit in rows on benches, families together on graveled paths between weedless beds. There's a certain 1950s air about the dead, or early 60s perhaps, because they're clean and respectable and they don't stink of factories. As if they came after white nylon shirts, and indoor sanitation, but before satire, certainly before sexual intercourse. Damaged livers have been replaced, so their owners live to drink another day. Blighted lungs now suck at God's own low tar blend. Cancerous breasts have been rescued from the surgeon's bin and blossom like roses on spirit chests. Earlier this year, Hilary and Gerald felt that they wanted a change of scene and decided to move to the seaside, to Budley Salterton in Devon. It was intended as the fulfillment of a childhood dream. This is a photograph of Hilary on the beach at Budley, taken when she was 16. She has, perhaps at last, found a kind of peace. Are you happy? From time to time, yes. It may sound like a superficial answer, but it depends almost entirely on the last sentence I wrote. If it was a good one, I'm happy. Uh, if I'm plunged into uncertainty about that sentence, I have to live with a lot of ambivalence and ambiguity as to whether something is going to work, whether my scene is going to work. So I don't have the temperament that's ever going to be able to stand back and say, I am happy. Because I'm always going to say, could be a bit happier with a few adjustments. But I am beginning a new phase of my life. Uh, because I'm going to live by the sea, which I've always wanted to do. And... 
I'm hoping for a bit more inner calm. I want to watch the sea and learn from it. Um, because the pattern is irreversible, irreducible. Um, there may be a storm blowing up, but basically you have the same waveform coming and going. It's almost as if I'm wanting to hear my own heartbeat. Um, I think that's what I'd like to be able to do.